All right, guys, thank you again for tuning in tonight. Um, my name is Omer. I'm one of the medical students who helped um, kind of put this event together. Um, and I'm really happy to have you, all you guys here tonight for this exciting event. Um, it wasn't, um, this event was not possible without a lot of people supporting us, um, some of whom are on this call tonight. So we just want to thank everyone, um, including Vince, um, uh, who's uh, also uh, a very important organizer for this event. And then also uh, we have our guest speaker tonight. Um, we're really excited to have him. Uh, Dr. Plotnick is an interventional radiologist and assistant professor of interventional radiology at the UCLA Medical Center and David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, he has a lot of um, areas of clinical expertise and interest um, in, in research, including uterine fiber embolization, prostate artery embolization, deep vein thrombosis, peripheral ar arterial disease, and interventional oncology, uh, particularly Y90 transarterial radioembolization therapy. He's also involved in researching and advancing other cutting edge therapies, such as percutaneous cholangioscopy, which is a GI procedure, and then genicular artery embolization, and several more. He's also the co-director of the IVC filter clinic, and he's also a member of the UF, uh, UCLA fibroid treatment program. So we're really excited to have doc, Dr. Plotnick talk about a lot of uh, important service lines in IR tonight. Um, and he's definitely been involved in, in patient care um, and research in these areas. So without, a, without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Plotnick to kind of get the ball rolling tonight. Thank you guys. Now I wanna thank uh, Omer and Vince for getting these things, uh, this talk going, and uh, they've done a great job. And it, it is strange talking into the computer, not seeing anybody. Uh, I'm gonna put some of these people's faces here. Maybe you guys can, I'm not sure you see that on the screen, but uh, feel free to jump in. You know, when I give these lectures to, to my residents, I often call on them because it's, it's often strange having complete silence, so just my voice for a full hour or 45 minutes or whatever. And I'm much more of an interactive kind of person. But um, so feel free to stop me at any time. You know, at, you know, I'm not sure what everyone's level is, but I'm assuming everyone on the call, or let's see, what, 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 what do we have here? We have 20 people. Uh, everyone wants to be an interventional radiologist, I'm assuming by now. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's definitely an excellent option, you know, I, I had a lot of difficulty deciding what I wanted to do as a medical student, but um, I could tell you now that in the end, uh, I'm super happy with being an interventional radiologist because it is a fun job. It's a, it's a fun job and uh, it's interesting. We do, we do interesting procedures and uh, it, I, I, mean, I, I just compared to what other, other specialties, I can't imagine anything else that I rather do. And you get to learn more and more stuff and more and more procedures as you go and things change so much. So it's always, you know, enjoyable, interesting. And there's so many different, you know, areas that you can get yourself into. So it's so broad. So it is, uh, if you haven't thought about it or you are thinking about it, I'm assuming you have, I encourage you to proceed. And I tell you what, when I was a third year medical student or, or like where Omar or Vince is, I had no idea what IR was. And these guys, and, which is amazing. These guys know so much about it now, and and uh, really, it's 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 exciting for the future of IR because uh, you guys are coming in, and they're going to be the next generation, and uh, it's going to be great. So we'll go and talk about we're going to talk about a couple of areas, a couple of areas that I do, you know, some of my interventions on, and these areas are really interesting, and the procedures are fun, and uh, and basically. Um, for those of you who don't really know what interventional radiology, this is, I mean, often my, you know, I, I doubt my parents could even tell you exactly what I do. They wouldn't be able to say what, what their son is. No way they know what I am. They, 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 have no, they, they could probably say interventional radiology, but they wouldn't know what I do. And uh, I don't know if my wife really knows what I, exactly what I do. But, uh, and some physicians don't know what we do. But basically, you know, we do... Um, and that's kind of cool, I guess, in a way, but it, it kind of leaves us in a difficult situation of not, of not having, you know, a footprint, you know, that people understand. But basically, you know, we will do a lot of minimally invasive image guided procedures 
over you know a large variety of, of organs you know traditionally it was more vascular and i do a lot of i'm not sure whether um you probably didn't omed didn't probably say i do a lot of vascular work i do a lot of pad work which is not probably maybe hasn't discussed it there but i do a lot of pad um uh work but uh a lot of it was vascular uh but you know as other specialties have come in and you know and and taken up some of the work we, we've broadened our, our our scope and gone to a lot of other areas and uh you know basically minimally invasive areas so that's the fun thing about ir and that's why you know you can be a guy that wants to do ablations or be a guy that does a lot of vascular work which is what i do when i'll be a guy that does cancer or be a guy that does neuro or be a guy that does you know there are so many other areas in, in this job so that's why it's, it's kind of cool um and yeah i guess this shows some of the areas that, that people do um we're going to talk about about these three areas today we're going to talk about some of the research in these three areas some of the three big some some, some big trials in these areas uh and um yeah i mean for me I, I do a lot of uh, um, these areas, and also I do a lot of CLI, um, which I think is, you know, uh, just a great area to get involved in women's health. You know, there's, uh, there's so many areas, ABMs, it's very broad. And that's really what's kind of fun about it all. Um, and, uh, and so there are many opportunities down the road. Um, so we're going to go into uh, we're going to go into we're, we're going to get started uh, into. Is any other any questions at all before we get started? We're going to start talking about some of these areas and uh, and some and, and some trials and some uh, you know one trial. But we can be we can we can you know change you know tack depending on what you guys want. But let's start off with BPH because this is a great area and uh, a really up and coming area and really getting traction. And, uh, and as you guys may or may not know, depending on where you guys are in medical school, but BPH is super common. And uh, it is uh, basically an enlargement of not larger of the gland and there's some predominantly in the transitional zone. And you know, there are some hormones that are, it is growth potentiated from, but it's a benign enlargement of the prostate gland essentially. And it's super common. Uh, a lot of men have it, you know, I think as I said, 70% of men age 60, 69, and, and it increases, uh, you know, as you get older. So basically some degree all men will get it. So it's super common. And basically this disease has, put, has allowed most urologists to send their kids to private school. And this is their bread and butter, which is why it, it does, it, you know, we do compete somewhat with the urologists. Um, the, the thing with this is that these guys get uh, lower urinary tract uh, symptoms or LUTs. And uh, that is basically best, best sort of scored with the IPSS score. And we, we, we get, I, get, I get all my patients to fill this out. And, uh, and that really looks at the quality of life and how, how, and how, and how it affects the patient. And really, um, these symptoms are, can be divided. In, we're not going to go too deep into it because that would be an hour lecture about it but um they were obstructive and they're irritative storage issues but essentially you know we we are it's not cancer we're treating quality of life and that's kind of interesting part of you know what we could get to do we get to treat these patients who are not in this area not that super sick but have poor quality of life and we can really change their, their life and we have i've done it where, where these guys come in and they're like and they come back you know two weeks later and they're like doc you changed my life and it's it's pretty amazing um so but, you know, the mainstay for, these, for this has been medical therapy, medical management and lifestyle modification. You know, the alpha reductase inhibitors and the alpha blockers, you know, um, finasteride or, you know, uh, tamulosin, um, uh, these kind of medications. But uh, they might, and they help to reduce the, the gland size and they re reduce, the, you know, the growth of the gland. But, you know, often these have many side effects and, you um, the patient's kind of tolerated them or it doesn't work for a while. So then there's other therapies. And really, we divide those therapies into sort of minimally invasive therapies and sort of more invasive. And TERP is the gold standard, but obviously these things have issues, complications associated with them. Uh, obviously, when the prostate gland gets bigger, it gets more challenging. And there are some sort of minimally invasive, uh, smaller options. But uh, that's, where, that's where PAE comes in. PAE is, and we're basically, at PAE, you know, 
where PAD, uh, where I've initially sort of reached out to the urologist has been to try to help them out with the ones that they that don't want to do, you know, the large glands, glands greater than 100 cc's. And uh, it all, the, I mean, in, in essence, PAE started by treating, you know, uh, hemorrhage or, or, or hematuria. But as we've, as we've seen, you know, the, the, the result is it, it's, it's gone in, in growth and it's getting much more common and uh, it's, it's, it's a viable option. Uh, and, and, and generally, I would try to work hand in hand with the urologist. We do get a lot of patients to come in for the for a direct referral, but it is uh, we, we get a lot. Of, you know, we I try and target ones that that that, that the prostate gland is large because those are the ones that are more difficult for for the surgeons uh, to do either a, either a terp or, or, or prostatectomy because they're minimally invasive things such as Eurolift or something that resume. Those are the ones you know they may struggle with with certain large prostate glands. So that leaves us to there's been plenty of trials and there's plenty of data out there and the data is good. Uh, and uh, we're going to go over one of the trials there. So is it, so is anyone got any questions before we get into it? Because I, I could I could li literally talk about prostate embryonization for another hour, but I'm not going to. So is, is there any uh, any questions about that? No, nothing. Fair enough. Let's go into it. Okay. Oh, Mary Vincent, you can you can add in anything if you want, and and, and I'm not sure there's a, there's a chat group growing, but if there if, if have any questions, you can also send out questions via a chat group. Is that right, boys? Correct, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, we, we'll get correct. up to the yep, we're correct. So if you have any questions, you can you can you can just send them to there, and we'll, we can go over at the end of each paper. So. Uh, this paper came out, and in, in, in the problem with this is there's only a few randomized trials, and it's, it's hard to really get the, you know, it's hard to convince the urology society. And, and, and actually, when you look at some of the guidelines in the UK, it's been more favorable, but, but here in the US, it's been more challenging. And we've had some challenges with some insurance companies. But basically, this trial came out, uh, and this is mo mostly from the, from, from, from the team in Portugal, uh, um, the Carnavales group. Kind of Ali passed away, but uh, but um, um, kind of yeah. So this is this is uh, yeah. This is the Portugal group, and uh, and Isaac and Ari Isaacson, who was also on there. But um, this this trial this came out last year, and this is looking at trying to get, get a, a randomized trial to look at the non inferiority, which means let's try and see how this compares to BPH. Not not is it better, but you know, do we get similar results? Uh, and how can we compare them? So an admirable uh, attempt. Uh, be, obviously, we want to get our data. Funny. I decided there's just no dedicator. We He's want like, to get our data published in, in you know, urology yeah. journals. That would be better. <laughs> that'd be better. Um, but, um, you know, JVAR is, doesn't reach the urologist, but, but it's, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's good to get it published. But uh, that, so, Essentially, all this is basically how, how we perform, how I perform my PAE with 300 to 500 micron embospheres. So these are, for those of you who don't know, these are small, tiny little particles that we inject into the prostate artery. And these are the things that we want to look at. And as I said, you know, this would be a large, large, uh, long talk if I was talking about every, every aspect of it. But Qmax is, is your flow rates. Uh, and when the flow rates are less than 10, that's significant. That means you know you, you, you when you urinate, your stream is less than you know ten mils per second. IPSS scores above you know in the twenties. These are pretty high. Quality of life is quite four to five is quite terrible. And volume is, as I said before, anything over, over fifty is probably what you want to consider prostate embryo on. So their outcomes, their outcomes were were a change in the flow rate and reduction in IPSS, which are pretty. Which, which are, I guess, the benchmark outcomes. You really want to track your IPSS. And um, secondary outcomes of quality of life, prostate volume, which is not a significant thing. I don't really care who, I mean, it doesn't really matter how large a prostate gland is. It's nice to see it reduced in size, but what's more important is the symptoms. And what I, I mean, what I normally tell my patients is that it would, you know, a reduction of 40% is a pretty good reduction. And then they looked at our adverse effects. And uh, obviously, these are the definitions of their adverse effects. So, what did they see? Well, 
they saw um, a good, I mean, they sort of both therapies work great, which, I mean, we know Turbo works well, you know, it's the gold standard. But what they found out in their group that PAE worked, worked really well as well. And uh, you know, this is excellent. You know, in fact, we've got a PAE IPSS, which to me, in my mind, that's the most important thing, a mean reduction of, of, of 21 points, you know, and, you know, versus 18, well, that's, that's, a, that's, that's tons. That's a lot of reduction. That's, that's excellent. Um, the quality of life, the, the, the flow rates imp improved by six mils per second and not a bit more with TERP, but none of that was significant. But anyway, it basically shows that both of them were very good. And both of them were very effective, and they weren't they weren't significantly um, different. Um, the QMAX was a bit better for PAE, but 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 um, favored that that favored um, um, Terp. But you know, for me, um, um, you know, I think that IPSS is probably the main thing. Uh, and it shows, as you expect, particularly in you know both the uh, both the PAE group and the IPSS group, uh, that which is interesting that 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 you know at three months, um, you know your your results uh, plateaued, and it started maybe started to get a little bit worse at about twelve months, which is possible as we know that you know you may regrow. Process, but not terrible. Interesting enough, enough that that uh, looked like the, the term took a few months for it to, to, to increasingly, you know, the, the, you know for, for, for the reduction to, to, to sort of take hold. Whereas, you know, it, it is a little more faster with the term, with the PAE. But both good results, you know, both good results. You know, you, you're, you know, it shows that it's effective and it's dur durable, at least at twelve months in this in this uh, in this in this trial. Maybe a little bit, maybe some, and we have to, and we are tweaking the technique a little bit to make sure we get you know longer durability. Um, so the quality of life significantly improved. And in fact, it looked like it was a bit, a little bit more um, um, in favor of the of the PAE quality of life, maybe because it was minimally invasive, uh, as we expect the volume to be more reduced with TERP. Uh, but um, other than that, um, most of the things were pretty much, you know, even. Uh, adverse effects, as we expect, a little bit more with the uh, with TERP. Most of these PEs are very mild. Now, one of the, th one of the things which, which I tell my patients is that, you know, you're not going to get the, the retrograde ejaculation, you're not going to get the erectile dysfunction, although it may be temporary um, that we see that, you know, compared to what we see in the TERP. So that's something that, you know, we can offer them um, rather than the TERP. But yeah, so a lot of really minor adverse effects. Um, pretty much, yeah, minor there. And uh, you can see the TERP definitely had more complications, particularly obviously more of the minor ones as well. Uh, I mean, this obviously this trial. This, this is a very small, small, uh, small trial, and there was some dropout. Uh, so um, they weren't really trying to get the. I mean, obviously, then they weren't really able to, to try and get the uh, the um, um, they weren't really able to get a full non inferiority. Now, interesting enough that they, they exclude a lot of prostate glands because they were greater than 100, 100 grams. I, most of my prostates are greater than 100 grams. So this is a sort of like a non, it's sort of not real world, real world, uh, you know, um, scenario because a lot of my prostate glands, I guess it's just trying to compare, compare, compare TERP and PAE, but um, it was single center, medium follow-up and, and obviously the prostate volume. But I think this is the main thing that I do a lot. I, I do a lot and I feel that a, a lot of the prostate glands that, that are greater than 100 grams, which were excluded, are the ones that I feel would do really well. P. So, you know, does it give me that? It's nice. This trial is nice. Does it? Does it? Uh, these, these are the these are the these are the other trials that come come out. Uh, again, not a lot of not a lot of 
not a lot of um, um, data out there, randomized controlled trials, not a lot. Um, there's a few. And uh, most of them do show that, that it's, that it's uh, we're still a while to go, most of them do show that there's, there's, there's a, you know, they're comparable or some of them shows it's even better. Um, but we will stop for there. And, and the issue, the main issue really is that, is that even though the, the nice UK guidelines recommend PE as an option, it is still be considered an experimental procedure, so quote unquote, in, in, by the AUA, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. Given the date, given that the, the limited data for some of their minimum invasive procedures, such as resume or or Eurolift, compared to this, so uh, this is one of my cases. This is a good case. So I'm going to show you. This is a guy's a 91 year old male patient. He had a, he had a foley in. He, he was he, he had a huge prostate in 193 and was referred to for a PAE. And this is basically what it looks like when we do the PAE. We select the prostatic artery here. Um, Here's a prostatic artery. Here's a common trunk with a fasciful. Uh, in this, in this one, he actually had a had a CTO. So I had to, I had to cross the CTO, use some peripheral arterial um, technology, and then get in the prostate artery. And uh, you can see we do a cone beam. And this guy did really well and got his uh, Foley catheter out. So we're going to stop there because it's obviously a very large topic. And we're going to see if anyone's got any questions about BPH and about and about and about PAE before we go on. But you know, I think it's, you know, it's our technique is changing a little bit. And I think that we're going to look at, you know, we're going to see some hopefully improved long-term durability results, um, but definitely very effective and definitely very effective on large prostate glands. Let's see if anyone, is anyone, are there any questions in, in, in the chat group about that? Yeah. Yeah. So we got a couple of questions in the chat. Go, go um, sure. The first question was, how do most of your patients for PAE get referred to your office? Very good question. You know, um, I do have a couple of urologists who send me send me cases, um, and they send me the stuff that, that I want to do. You know, someone, and I reach out to them. Someone who's on Plavix, someone who's on uh, who's on Aliquis with a large prostate, prostate gland of one one two hundred, what you know, one fifty. You know, um, those are the ones that that that, that, that I want to touch. You know, so those that that's where we started with. We do get some, we do get a lot of word of mouth and, um, you know, I just try and reach out to a lot of the younger urologists, you know, and try and get some work. So, and then you get a good result and then they, they may send you some other patients, you know, the stuff they don't want to do. So you have to work with the urologists. So that's, that's how I do it. Uh, you know, luckily where I work here in UCLA, you know, Justin McWilliams has done a lot of, a lot of good work in this area. And uh, I've been managed to, you know, be able to work, with him and, and obviously he's, he does a lot of PAE and uh, so we managed to get, you know, some, some inroads with some of the urologists. Look, a lot of the urologists, you know, a lot, some of them were just, you know, would, you know refuse to send you cases, you know, so it, it is challenging, but it's a combination of marketing out there, you know, whatever it be, YouTube or, or getting out the talks and then, and then, and then reaching for the, can, getting the ones from the urologists that they don't want to do. Yeah. Thank Anything you. Else? Yeah. Yeah. So the next question is, is there a difference in cost between PAE and TERP? Mm, is it different in cost? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think, well, I, I mean, I know the price of PAE. I don't, we, we, every, every institution is going to charge differently. Um, but, you know, I think if you're, if you're going to, when you stay overnight in the hospital, it's expensive. No matter what it is, you get a blood transfusion is expensive. So if you can do it as a single day care, I don't, I don't have the numbers and on the data, but if you can get if you can be done as an outpatient and you can be sent home that day, it's going to be cheaper. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Go for it. Are there are there any issues with having multiple PAE procedures? Very good question. You know, we don't know. Um, the, the main issue would be that it probably gets more challenging as you go in more, you know, more times. We know that when we repeat embolize a blood vessel, these blood vessels get jacked up and uh, they get occluded. And what happens is you get, you have to then treat what's called collateral blood flow. You know, that these prostate glands are sneaky and the body is, you know, is, is an amazing 
structure. And you can block blood vessels off and somehow it will find collateral. So you're dealing with the collaterals, which can be more challenging. So I wouldn't say there's an issue with repeat embolization. It says it will get harder as you do more repeat because you are chasing then very small collaterals. Maybe you get a big one and that, that, that it's easier to catheterize, but sometimes it just be hard. So you may get to a, a stage where it may come back you may try to do it, but you may be unsuccessful. Now, the thing is, you haven't burned any bridges. They can still do whatever they want to do. They can still go back for the turp or whatever they need after that. So it doesn't burn any bridges, um, so to speak. So, you know, you may, may not be as successful the second time around or third time around if you had to do it. So that's, that, that's the only issue. Awesome. We got one more question here. Go for it, go for it. Uh, from Derek. Are there any situations you can think Derek. of? Are there any situations you can think of that you would cho uh, choose TERP over PAE? Well, I would choose TERP over PAE. Um, well, you know, I mean, um, look, when when the prostate gland is smaller, is small you know, less than 50 cc, 60 cc, those ones are, those ones are hard and those ones I don't, I normally send back to the, back, back to the urologist. Whether they're going to do a TERP or whether they're going to do a Urolift or something else, I don't know what they're going to do. But um, those are the ones that I don't want to do. I think a small prostate gland, they may have very severe symptoms, but small prostate glands, you know, I would, I, 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 those are the ones that knock back. Other than that, once they're big or you know, greater than 100 cc is definitely, you know, um, 50 to 70, debatable, you know, about to them. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, anything small, send it, to the pro send, send it to the urologist. They may want to do a turp on that. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next topic because we're trying to get through a lot. Now, this is another fantastic area. See, I asked so many good areas, you know, I said, you know, I did, I did one this morning, I did a one night in this morning, actually. It's my clinic day, but I had to add, add a patient on. Um, but HCC, I mean, this is a fascinating area. And, and, and uh, this is a great area because there are so many ways that this can be treated and, um, and we can be involved in this care. We are, you know, we are, I work at a transplant center. So we do a lot of, a lot of HCC, but it's, you know, as we know, it's the most, common form of primary liver cancer. There are many causes of it. We see a lot of hepatitis related cirrhosis, alcohol related cirrhosis, NASH. Don't see a lot of hemochromatosis, but basically um, we're seeing more and more of it, okay? And, uh, and that's what it looks like. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna basically, uh, obviously cost, you know, it is a big burden, but anyhow, this is how we basically uh, stage it. And uh, there's, a, there's, there's many ways to stage it. And uh, this is just an algorithm that sort of puts these patients into a certain bucket. And uh, it's the BCLC guidelines. And uh, basically when you have a small tumor, you can cut it out or you can uh, burn it, for example. But as it gets bigger, um, you may have you know, other therapies, local regional therapies. Um, and maybe you'd be able to get a transplant, uh, but as it gets more advanced, then you get, you, you get into more advanced therapy. And obviously, um, that's, that's for chemotherapy and, uh, and, and obviously when it gets to D, it's the best supportive care. And these guys have just changed and, and they've changed uh, recently. And, and, and some of it has been for the paper we're gonna discuss, which is uh, one of my partners was, the, was, one of the, was one of the head authors on this. Uh, it was a very detailed slide, I gotta say. And um, you could spend an hour to go, go over the slide. But basically, if you look at the top of here, we've got early stage, very early, early, intermediate, advanced, and terminal. The so terminal is this for supportive care. Advanced is, as we said, it's chemotherapy. And obviously, we were Rich Finn, one of the oncologists here, was the lead author on the acetab, you know, uh, Atezo uh, bevacizumab paper. That showed an improved survival, but even if it's just a small amount, it did. Uh, and uh, where we work is in, in this area here. And uh, we work with either 
early stage ablation or if it's not, not feasible, maybe we do some, you know, Wainani or taste to try and get them to a transplant. We either downstage them for a transplant or we keep them on a transplant list. So it's a very detailed slide. And so we will, we'll probably jump, yeah, probably jump to this. This is sort of right, I guess, but basically, uh, um, you know, I mean, the cure for this is either surgical resection or a transplant and everything else, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, waiting for. And these patients are either going to die from advanced cirrhosis or liver failure, or they're going to die from advanced cancer. And we, we, we somewhere in the middle judging, uh, uh, juggling that tightrope. And that can be a tightrope that's often hard to, to juggle, but it's enjoyable. You know, this is, and that's what I'm saying is another area of intermediate radiology they can really get your teeth into. And there were guys that have done their entire career that are so deep in HCC, the same way there were guys that are so deep in B BPH. In fact, you know, there were guys now that have their entire career, in fact, only doing PAE. And there were guys, that were, you, know, you know, guys or girls, all whole career does doing oncology. And that's the cool thing. Or you can do both like up me, which is good, which is kind of fun. Um, but it's enjoyable areas. And so this is what I like about this area because it's, you know, there's a lot of thought. It's not just, you know, the, the, the interventional side, the procedure side is, 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 is only part of it, but it's the process behind it, which takes the thought and process, which is what, why it's kind of fun. You get to use your brain a little bit. And we know that, um, you know, what we want to try and do is keep these patients on, 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 on the transplant list. Because especially in, in, in California, they can be on this for, for, you know, for, for two years. There are parts of the Midwest, you, you'll be on, you, you can get a transplant much quicker. So we do a lot of things where we can keep these patients in to, hold on a second. So we can keep them on the transplant list and keep them in what's called Milan criteria, which was an old, which is, which is um, uh, a, a, a criteria to keep them on transplant three tumors less than three centimeters or one less than five. You need to go in, you don't need to know all that, but there are multiple ways that we do that. Okay, so one of the ways is radio embolization or Y90. And this is where this therapy, this is where this trial comes in because, you know, until now, Y90, which is an excellent modality, it had been a RDE or, or, or it, there had been, a, been, been so an HDE, human device exemption from the, from the FDA to use it. So it had to be on an IRB and it had to be on a trial, even though it's, we know it's so effective and it's so universally done. It's amazing to think about because it is really hard to compete in this space of oncology. It is hard to compete with oncologists because they can do trials with 6,000 patients, randomize them, standard therapy. And, and we, it is very hard to do, or nearly impossible to do procedural randomized control trials. You can't do it. I mean, the, it's very hard for surgeons to do it. Very hard, you know, it's very hard for us to do it. And that's where it's been really, and, and you probably can't do it these days. So in that setting of the difficulty of that, and obviously, you know, the oncologists can do that. That's where they, 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 they can dominate this field. So given that challenge, that's where this, this came about. And you can see legacy, a few things about this paper. It's published in hepatology, not JVIR. That's a huge thing. You know, oncologists don't read JVIR. You know, they, you know we need to, we got to publish in oncology journals or hepatology journals. So that's the first thing that they did. And you got Riyadh, so you can see the authors, Riyadh Salim, Guy Johnson, Ed Kim, and then Sid Patio, one of my partners, Robert Lewandowski. These guys are all big guys in, in Y90. And it's basically between uh, Northwestern, um, you know, uh, no, uh, Seattle, um, uh, Mount Sinai, and, uh, and you know, and the UCLA. And basically, the idea with this trial really was to was, was was focused on let's we need to get some data showing that this is clinically effective um, for unresectable HCC as a first line therapy to to treat them at, at at a high dose. What do I mean, high dose? Well, 
the way we do Wainani has changed over the years a lot. And initially it was for, yeah, let's see if we go into, yeah, initially for Wainani, it was more, if we go to these, it's, it was more done when these things failed. Okay, this is in the previous BCLC category. But you know, when there's multifocal disease or, and these guys are never gonna do well. But what if we get these guys who have a single tumor and they're otherwise well, and we can hit them with a high dose radio emulization, a high dose, like an ablative dose, high grade, which we know has been working, but we haven't any data for that. So that, this is what this is all about. We want to, let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this, this exact question with the idea that we can, get, we can get this thing FDA approved and change the guidelines, okay? So this is basically what we do. This is Y90, anyhow, Y90, you inject the, uh, the radionuclide attached to, you know, the, um, attached to the beads. Uh, it is glass and resin, you know, for, for both, but this is all for therosphere. And, um, and basically, these guys were, in, the, the criteria kind of changed. It was patients who had, a, who had a single mass and that were relatively either, you know, well, the child PUK case A, a, a. Uh, most of them were gonna get segmental, high dose radiation dose. And then they wanted to see what was the, um, what was the objective response and what duration response like other therapy and what was the time to progression, progression free survival and overall survival. So that, that, that was the, the, the and, and, and what they did was that they, um, they got independently reviewed their, their results and it was multiple centers. Okay. Um, so looking at high, more looking at high dose. Um, and so that's what they did. So it was a more ablative dose, high dose segmentectomy, would we call it, radiation segmentectomy, and not the loba stuff. And a lot of the other trials were more loba. Okay, what does loba mean? It means you give a generalized dose over the whole lobe. This is no, this is, let's go in, we're going in for the kill. We're going in for, for a single tumor. We're going in for the kill. Okay. And uh, what did they find? Well, they found that they had, and they looked at all these, we're not going to go into all the difference in between M resist and M resist uh, and resist and localized M resist, but basically this is, looks at, you know, the, the response to the tumor. Best response is like the immediate response and, and confirmed response is like, like maybe like a month later has it been resolved, but they found that they had an excellent response rate. Okay. Um, and the, the, the duration of response lasted you know, greater than six months in, in 83% of patients. And, and what they did as well, which, which is not really, we can't really see here, but is, is, is they knew the data that the FDA required to get it approved, you know, the minimal amount it needed. And that, 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 this, is, this whole trial was designed to get the FDA approval, get, get Therosphere off, off uh, the, 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 the HDE and, and get it get it approved. Um, and you can see here that we're looking at, you know, that, that this, is, this, is, uh, this is the complete response rates, uh, the change in, and, okay, so this, this is what we wanna see here. You can see here for, for um, time to progression, zero for localized M resist and 84% and were you know so most of these patients 84 percent were had not progressed at 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 uh, 24 months progression free, free survival local you know 94 percent for localized so these patients you can see that when you get a good you need a good therapy these patients will be progression free for for a long time and the, 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 this is for, this is localized and this is the modified so these results are actually excellent um, overall survival, very good, ridiculous, very good. And, uh, you know, considering some of these patients were up to eight centimeters, so 95% and, uh, and, and 87% at 24 and 36 months. 
and, and, and if, you had, if you had a resection or if you were downstage to resection or transplant, that bumped that even more. So it shows that it, it, it is a durable result on its own. And it's even better if combined with, 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 with transplant. And patients that, you know, which is what we all knew, but this is just, this is just the concrete data, the stuff that we knew. And this, this, this stuff is, you know, this is the key thing in overall survival. So this is the summary here. This is another point here, which we, we see, you know, before this, the guidelines, in fact, the, the, the HDE guidelines, the, 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 the one that was the FDA guidelines, it was the maximum dose you meant to give to the, the, the liver was 120. And if you were giving, four, well, I was all, we were all giving 400, 500, because we knew that worked. We had to fudge it with, with you know, we, we had to lie basically on, on, our, on, our, on our dose reports because that was out of the guidelines. But now, it's, you know, we know now that we have to give a very high localized dose, 400, 500 gray. And, and, and this, was, this is obviously the first paper that brought this out and published it. And now the FDA understand that. And so that, we need to be giving these high doses. So 93% of patients at three years um, were su survival, if, particularly if they have transplant. There was an excellent survival rate when it was the primary therapy, low recurrence rate. Um, and they, I know everyone responded. So um, where does it leave us? It leaves us with, with a lot of, you know, a lot of different, different ideas where this can fit in, where it can fit in with immunotherapy, uh, combination, um, downstaging, um, and, uh, and the ability to, 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 to expand the use of therospheres given that it's FDA approved. And here we go. This is this is this is a great case here. This is an eight, eight centimeter tumor. This is one of my cases. Um, and uh, this guy, this guy is fifty one. He 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 has he's actually uh, schizophrenic. So you know, not ideally for, for you know a high functioning schizophrenic, but not ideal for a transplant. And uh, you can see this this is the th the mapping angiogram we do. There was actually, he actually also had a, had a replaced right hepatic, uh, accessory right hepatic. So there was another branch here. But in this guy, I actually treated him twice because my first dose was probably not high enough. I probably wasn't getting full 450 gray. So I brought him back. And this looks like he, it looks like he's been resected. I mean, what an amazing result. It's like a wet, like that black hole is there was a tumor there. It looks like it's been ablated. It's such a high dose. I gave him a huge dose, maybe 800 gray. You know, just a, a bombed it, and that's what you got to do, and that's what you know. That's what this data shows. So, uh, since then, it, the BCLC category, uh, uh, BCLC guidelines have changed, uh, and it's been FDA approved. So, you know, hopefully, we'll see an expansion. We know it depends. You know, certain centers do more wine only for for smaller tumors. We do a lot of ablation, but when tumors are about four or five centimeters. Above, you know, this eight Y ninety definitely as a therapy. So that's a very brief rundown of that. I'm sure there'll be some questions with that. Um, yeah. So yeah. we did we did get a question from the chat. Um, yes. First one is how do you decide between doing taste versus tear? Well, I hardly. I, I, there's very few occasions where I want to do taste. Very few occasions. I mean. I can't think, you know, very few, maybe if like, if it's, like if it's salvage, multifocal, there's disease everywhere, maybe I'll do like a gel foam and I'll do like a conventional taste or I'm trying to, I won't do a taste ablation. But my goal is, is generally, depends on, on, what, on what, depends on what we're dealing with. But if we can, and if it's a single tumor, if it's a single tumor, there's no way I'm doing taste. Only like, maybe if he, if he, if he got rejected, if there was an insurance issue, maybe then that's the only way. A single tumor, why not? Or ablation if it's small. You know, so there's no role for taste, I, I feel. Um, and, but, you know, other centers will do it because some insurance companies want to prove it. You know, when there's multifocal disease and it's more salvage, you, you go either way. You know, you, and there's multifocal, you could do why not? Or you could do some sort of, you know, conventional taste. Or maybe you do a taste ablation for certain cases. You know, that's pretty reasonable. Five centimeters, you know, you could taste it. With a with ablation, but yeah, I, I would tend to move, favor you know um, uh, wine only. I do very little taste. 
Thank you. The uh, next question is, how do you, how did you determine the radiation dosage for the HCC treatment? Um, Very good question. Okay, how do you, how do you figure the dose out? Um, well, what you, what you do for the dose, what I do for the therapies is that there is a, uh, there is a, there is a spreadsheet. And when you're doing your mapping angiogram, you do what's called the cone beam CT. I'm not sure you guys know what that means, but it's a CAT scan. Okay, you can do a CAT scan, and from there you can segment out the volume, okay, of tissue, okay, and that's the area that 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 we, your final position. Uh, just say it's over here, it's this area here, and you can, and you put that volume in the, in in the spreadsheet, which is supplied by Boston and you know Therosphere, and it will tell you the dose that that, that tissue will get. Now, it's not perfect because there are other, other elements to that because sometimes you get some flow dis distribution, you know, in, in the area that has a tumor. But it will show, for example, in that evened area of tissue, what dose you'll get in gray, you know, for, for what, whatever, because you can order the wine, these wine arnies in different, in different, different uh, doses, three, five, seven, you know, GBQ, 10, 15. And you'll be able to calculate. So you'll be able to sort of, put the numbers in and figure out, oh yeah, if I give a three here in this, in this tumor, I'm going to get a hundred gray. If I give a five, I'm going to get 300. But if I put a seven, I'm going to get 400. But if I put a 10, I'm getting a 600 gray. And that's how I figure it out. So I put that cut and, and I figure out what I want. And these days, you know, you, you need to be giving a high, if the guy's got good liver function and he's in, uh, you need to be doing much. And that's why this, in this case, particularly, I, I went back a few. I went back a second time because I think I underdosed him. So we need to be doing high dose. We need to get to uh, we need to get to four hundred at least, five hundred gray. So you put those calculations in, and you'll be able to tailor exactly and order the right dose to really give a high high dose ablation to to, the, to that to that area. And that, that and that's kind of fun, you know. You can sort of figure that out and, and, and it's, it's an enjoyable part of the procedure. We also got another question from yep. the chat. Are there any new adverse effects to look out for when using high dose Y90? I mean, um, well, you're very, very selective. So that's, that, this is the amazing thing. You know, this is, the, you know, I had a case recently and the guy's Billy Rubin was four, four. Now, I'm not sure you guys understand this because you guys are very early in your career, but that's pretty bad. Now, I would have been really scared. Like, back, you know, I mean, no one, you know, I mean, most people would have said, that's crazy. And I was very nervous about it. But we're so selective. Sometimes we're so far down this tree, this arterial tree, that uh, in, in, in essence, you're so far down here and you're, so, you're basically only treating tumor. That these guys, in fact, he's Billy Rubin improved. So, so I think, you know, I think basically with these advanced selective, selective therapies, we can, we can minimize a lot of complications such as liver failure. Yeah, you don't want to be injecting the Y90 into the bowel. I mean, that's, that's, that, that you'll be in trouble then, you know, and those things we always looked out for. But I think that, that we are able to do a lot, a, lot, a, lot, and a lot of things more selective if it's only treating tumor, you know. So, um, yeah, we see the... You, the the ability to, to treat these kind of patients that are somewhat more difficult, if you're very selective, you can do it in the right circumstances. But yeah, I mean, no, no. no. Yeah. Any other questions? That's it. That's it. Okay. Well, anyhow, so it's a fun area of of of, of interventional radiology, and uh, lots of time. Oh, the last area we're going to talk about uh, is is venous disease. Uh, which is another area that I do. And um, we're going to talk about, about the ATTRACT trial, um, which was not the, the, the most positive trial for us, unfortunately. But I feel that since the ATTRACT trial, which came out a few years ago, things have shifted a little bit. And I think they've shifted a lot because of te new technology coming through and, uh, and right patient selection. But DVT is super common. And as interventional radiologists, as you guys will be, as all of you, as you, all, all you 20, patient, 20 guys and girls will be, hopefully, interventional radiologists, 
And this area has really grown, I think. You know, it's ebbed and flowed, but we are doing more pulmonary interventions. We do more DVT interventions. And I can tell you that the way we treat this stuff now is different to my fellowship. My fellowship was only five, six years ago. And uh, it's different now. I mean, the way I do it now is not how I was doing it in the fellowship. But uh, you know, this this is the basic basic you know um, you know um, pathophysiology of uh, of DVT. We all, most of you guys know this stuff. We're going to sort of skip over that. But you know, Verkov's triad, and you know, why treat DVT in the first place? Well, you know, there's there's two reasons really why, and one would be more for like patients at risk of limb threat, such as phlegmasia. You know, when the, when the when the pressure, the venous pressure is so high that it's infecting the arterial inflow, or the complications of, of, of DVT, which is post-thrombotic syndrome. And uh, post-thrombotic syndrome is super hard to tr treat. I mean, once you get these patients like this, it's super hard to treat it. Um, very hard, you know, these are really difficult patients, especially when they get venous ulcers. Um, so yeah, guidelines, I mean, Garlands basically have been, you know, anticoagulation, which is the, which is, which is, you know, sort of standard, standard therapy. Uh, now, thrombolytic therapy, um, you know, some of the guidelines have been, you know, when there's been limb threat, for example, or, uh, yeah, it's when we've considered it, and pulmonary embolectomy, surgical thrombectomy, maybe for like phlegmasia, and this is when they, this is what they do for open, open, uh, open thrombectomy. These guidelines have kind of changed quite a bit. Uh, now, the ATTRACT trial, which came out in 2017, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is unusual for an IR paper, came off the back of the CAVIN trial. The CAVIN was in, is, it was in Scandinavia. And the CAVIN trial was positive. And that found that, that the CAVIN showed significant reduction in, in post thrombotic syndrome of two and five years. But this trial was, again, it was to look at that. It was the open label phase three multi-center trial, randomized control trial, 690 patients with DVT. Are, are they getting anticoagulation plus pharmacomechanical catheter directed thrombolysis or anticoagulation alone? So two patients, exactly. Are, are they getting standard care or you get, or you get this? And uh, they'll, they're basically looking at, is this going to reduce post thrombotic syndrome? And then some other set adverse effects in quality of life. And so uh, what they did, they included all these patients either together in one sort of, because, it, you know, with, with, with this kind of work, there were many ways to skin a cat. And I can tell you that it wasn't all done universally the same. Um, but there'd be either you put a catheter in and you give them TPA or you, you do some mechanical thrombectomy, be it, here, they probably did either angiogen, which is a realytic, or some sort of aspiration, or maybe trellis, plus or minus venoplasty and stenting if you had to do something, such as like a methanol lesion, for example, which is what we often see. Um, this is what some of the things, we don't, we don't even use, this is, this would be like a penumbra, which is just a big tube to suck the clot out, and this is angiogen, which is uh, <coughs> the realytic therapy, which is kind of sucks fluid out and in, creates a vortex and, and, and takes out at the clock. Trellis, I, I'm not even on the market anymore. Um, so this is, this looks at the patients, you know, what they did and what they had done and, you know, venoplasty and uh, other therapies, for example. Um, obviously stents, uh, stents have changed a lot since then, since 2017. And anyhow, so so just to get so the primary outcome for these patients was looking at post thrombotic syndrome. You know, does this treatment does it help these patients? Do you, if you get a DVT and you come to emergency department, are you going to be less likely to get post thrombotic syndrome if you if you get sent up and get the the the, the lysis or the therapies, or are you going to be the same at two years if you just go home and, and take anticoagulation? And then look at the other things such as post thrombotic syndrome or. Uh, quality of life, safety, all these kind of other factors. Uh, now, this is how you scale, this is how you judge post thrombotic syndrome. You look at these things called the Velada scale. This looks at all the aspects of post thrombotic syndrome. You know, that grades it from very severe, you've got an ulcer to, to, to nothing or mild. 
And you can see this guy's obviously got very, very bad, very bad personal robotic syndrome. Uh, this is the VCSS classification. So you get, let's get to the crux of it all. At the end of the day, in this trial, they did not find a significant difference between post robotic syndrome between the treatment group and the control group. See, they didn't find it, which is unfortunate, you know, and there were some reasons why. Basically the same, but there was an increased risk of bleeding. So this basically, in many ways, this kind of put the brakes on, on, on catheter-directed lysis for DVT. Um, now, on secondary analysis, what we did find out was that those, symptoms, those patients who had very severe disease, um, um, uh, those and who had very severe symptoms and who had, who, had, who had very proximal disease, there was a trend to, 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 to improvement uh, with, with, uh, with um, you know, with, with, well, there was actually significance, but it was, sec it was a secondary analysis. So patients who had, who had proximal disease, so what does that mean? Somebody has very severe symptoms and patients who have proximal iliofemoral, like the clot is much higher up, not just in the in the in the in the in the femoral the pop, those guys uh, had had some improvement in post thrombotic syndrome. So that 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 is the uh, um, let's see here, but, that, but that's the um, uh, some of the limitations. Those are some of the issues, really. I guess that 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 they lost a lot of patients. The patients were hard to stratify. There's very variations in techniques, and they this is the main thing. They include femoral popliteal DVT. See these patients, you know, that was a problem. So when I looked at the subgroup, I looked at those with, with, with more proximal disease, they, those patients did better. So, um, here we go here. Patients with, with uh, uh, reduced the risk of moderate to severe PD disease, patients with iliofemoral DVT. So those patients that had Iliofemoral DVT, there was a reduced risk of moderate to severe post thrombotic syndrome. So, but you had to fish that out of the data, you know? So, that could be beneficial to that group. The bottom line is uh, did they put the brakes on, on things? It did a little bit. But since then, um, you know, we, here we go, you know, we do treat, you know, we do, we do treat a lot of DVT, but I only treat proximal DVT. So, you know, if someone had a clot in their femoral vein or popliteal vein, I wouldn't necessarily treat that. Maybe they were very young and had very severe symptoms. But other than that, it's generally proximal DVT, iliofemoral DVT. That's what we treat. And uh, here's a case. This is a great case. This is a case that we did a few months ago. She's a 33-year-old female. You can see, look, she's got, she's got phlegmasia already. You know, it's almost purple. And the it was Friday afternoon. The she just had a C-section. The surgeon wanted, wanted to, they were thinking about like doing a fasciotomy. And we brought her up quickly. And this is how, this is how I normally do these, these days. I use a, a device called Inari, uh, the clot treever. And uh, this is all done single session. It takes me about one hour to do the whole thing. I remove all the clot in a single sweep or a few sweeps. And then you can see here, there's the Mayferna lesion, the tight lesion, and put a stent in there. And she's, this is literally on the table. Look at the, this isn't the same lighting, everything the same. She's gone from purple to normal color foot within one hour. And there's the clot we took out. And there's the stem looking, looking and she did great. She did awesome. So um, where's, the, where's the future for DVT management? You know, I, I think there's, the way we treat it has changed a lot. Um, uh, this is the so this is the this is the I'm I'm actually the PI and this this is the the, the clot treatment uh, device I'm actually the PI for 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 the clout registry in UCLA and um, it is a great it's a revolutionary device that with this changed the way we do you know thrombectomy single session mechanical thrombectomy without lysis so I think now today in 2022 we're treating much more proximal DVT with severe symptoms. And, uh, and and a lot 
and majority were treating with single session, you know, no risk of TPA, no risk of blood loss, no risk of bleeding. So all those risks, you know, are, 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 are changed. And it's a, a tract would be different now if we did it these days. It'd be, uh, it'd be a much more universal approach for therapy, maybe all clot treatment, maybe all mechanical, maybe one, one way of doing it, maybe all proximal DVT. And so maybe that, that things would have, would have changed, you know, I think, and I think that would have changed if you looked at that more tighter, you know, control. But back then there was a bit of a hodgepodge and that's where the, that's where the trial sort of got off the rails a little bit. Uh, so it's been, it's been me for a while. Anyway, any questions about that? Because uh, obviously that's, you know, that is, uh, you, I mean, if you guys are on Twitter or something, you're seeing lots of the, these mechanical thrombectomy cases, but uh, you've got any questions about, about that? And I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, Omer and Vince. Dr. Plotnick, uh, just a quick question for me, maybe not so quick because it's, yeah. it might be a little loaded, but uh, could you talk to us a little bit about your experience as a PI for the clot registry and how you've been able to set that up and integrate that in your, in your clinical practice, but also your academic interests? Yeah, um, and yeah we, you know, we are an academic center, um, so it, it's been a little bit hard to, to enroll some patients, but you know, we do a lot of trials here uh, and um, you know, they, 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 uh, they, you know, just, I guess, as part of a very high, um, you know, one of the one of the big academic centers, a lot of these companies come out to us and and, and ask to set set that up. And we have some research staff, so it's a bit of a pain getting getting it started. But um, you know, we do a lot of trials, so we have some we have we have almost a sort of system to get these things going. And uh, so, you know, we do. That's how basically you know these these opportunities come to us. Um, so we do, I mean, we do a lot, a lot of other, other DVT trials and PE trials. So uh, luckily, you know, we get, we do get approached by a lot of companies. Uh, I mean, this is, this is obviously a, a, a industry sponsored trial. Um, so it depends. Some things, you know, require more funding, some things don't. So, you know, there is a lot of you guys who get involved in research, there's a lot of hurdles, and, uh, but um, uh, it's part of being part of an academic practice. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Looks like we don't have any questions in the chat at the moment. All right. Well, I mean, and again, I, I hope you guys have seen that, you know, this is a broad area. Like we've gone from PAE to, 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 to Y90 to, to this. And, and you could have this all one day. You could do a DVT and you could do a, a Y90 and a, and a PAE in, uh, in one day. That's a pretty good day. It's a pretty fun day. And these are all very effective therapies and, and things are moving all along. You know, this clot treatment, this wasn't around when I did fellowship. You know, we were putting everyone on license and now we're not. And, it's, it, and things are changing all the time. So it's pretty cool. And I guess we're going to go over now to, to your medical student. Yes. So um, we're really excited to have um, a guest speaker, another guest speaker, a surprise guest speaker. Um, we wanted to have someone who can talk about pursuing uh, research in interventional radiology as a medical student, because we all know how hard it can be to find research mentors and opportunities or even experiences. So we're really lucky to have uh, Malcolm Burks. He's a medical student at Rosen Franklin University, Chicago Medical School. Um, Malcolm, whenever you're ready, would, would love to hear from you um, and your experiences you've had so far. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for everything. Thanks for having this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Plotman, for everything. You know, this has been a great, you know, learning experience for me and for everybody. You know, IR is exciting. That's what made me want to, you know, pursue it and go into research to learn more about it. So I can just run through my year of research and answer some couple of questions about it. Uh, so, like I said, I'm from Chicago. I'm going to Chicago Medical School, and I was fortunate enough to do research at Northwestern uh, in Dr. Mooley's lab, Dr. Sam Mooley's lab, me and um, my partner, I'm Rutha. Um, before, you know, get into it, let me explain a little bit about the research we did. Our research project was basically a proof of concept model to see if Y90 is effective and, and, and safe in treating prostate cancer. And we used um, canine models as a proof of concept uh, for that. 
and we were successful in proving that it is safe to do so. So it's, we was trying to see, is this something that we can use to treat prostate cancer in, in the future? So that's kind of just a super broad overview of what I did for the year. Um, before getting into that, uh, did I have any research experience before uh, starting my IR uh, year research? No, no real formal bench work. Uh, research. I had some in undergrad, but nothing serious. I did some public health research in a Mount Sinai Hospital here in Chicago, but formal bench work, I, I really didn't have that uh, good of a grasp on that. Uh, how I came across it was actually during my M1 year, it was an email that I received uh, when I was following in SEER, the SEER website, and it kind of piqued my interest. You know, they were doing some minimally invasive oncologic treatments, and, you know, I, that's when I was getting into IR. I just figured out what IR was and I was like this is crazy I didn't think that this could even be a specialty and I saw it and it just you know it's putting it back in my mind to see you know if this is available when I'm an M2 I'm definitely going to try to pursue it M2 year comes around and I actually saw that it was still there so I sent the email uh, got an interview with Dr. Mooley and the current uh, research fellow at that time and was able to secure the spot so you know I was just it was kind of a long game. You know, I didn't know if I was gonna get it or not, but I saw it and it piqued my interest. And I was lucky enough um, to get it. Um, during the research year, it was a huge learning curve. Um, I still remember the first day, uh, I kind of had an orientation with the current, uh, the current research fellow at the time. And I was like, what did I get myself into? You know, we're dealing with dogs, we're doing all this, you know, everything, it was just so much going on. So I was like, man, you know, like I really have to, try my best to keep up with the pace because they were really moving at the time with the project and you know the project you know that what i the reason why i really wanted to go through because i really had a passion for what they were trying to do you know trying to treat prostate cancer and you know can really help a lot of people so that's what kind of kept me uh kept me motivated throughout the year and it also you know especially with teamwork me and my partner i'm rutha we both had strengths and weaknesses we played off of each other to really you know, really get the project done. But most importantly, Dr. Mooley himself really laid out really good, you know, ideas and like expectations that he wanted. So we really tried to make sure that we met his expectations and potentially exceed them as well. Uh, and in closing, what I learned about a research year, I know a lot of us as students, you know, it's kind of hard to determine if you want to take a year. So what I would say is if you can find any opportunity that really speaks to you that you can possibly think is, you know, you're very passionate about, just do it. You know, it's, it was such a great learning experience and I've learned so much about research. I learned so much about myself, but most importantly, I think I've learned, you know, like what we are and what we're going to try to pursue. You know, we all want to be physicians and practicing physicians, you know, and with that, we're basically scientists. We want to ask a question, you know, like, can we do this? Can, is this possible? and then find a solution. And one of the cool things about the field of IR is that I really feel that we're at the, you know, the beginning stage of what can, the endless potential of this field. So to try to just find a question that you're passionate about and then try to solve it, I think IR is like a great medium to try to do that. And for me, I also, since I knew I, I'm kind of a non-traditional student, I knew I had a lack in research. I wanted to really build a strong foundation of fundamentals so when I go further, I'm able to, you know, try to seek those questions and answer them as well and just have like a really solid foundation. So this year was one of the hardest years of my academic career, but one of the best. And I, I really highly recommend, you know, any one of you guys uh, to seek it and try to do it. So that's pretty much it. Thanks so much for sharing. Malcolm, thank you. That's excellent, excellent. And, and you had a wonderful opportunity working in Northwestern. And I encourage all you guys, if you're interested, to, to follow something like that if you can. But but as well, like if you, even if you can't be a full-time student, you always can be involved at any level, be it the society, be, you, know, you know, similar to what what, uh, what Omer is doing or Vince is doing. I mean, get involved at all, at, at, at any level. I mean, the more people we have in IR, the better as the field grows. And so... You know, we want everyone involved. So there's, a, there's, definitely a, 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 there's definitely a position or a spot for everybody at all levels, all kinds of interventional radiologists. There are the research guys, there are the, you know, the, the worker bees. So we need, we need all you know, to, to, to grow the specialty. The more of us that goes out there, the more of us that, that are there, the better the field you know, is in the end. So 
you know, I thank all you guys. Uh, you're doing a great job. Continue what you're doing. Continue the interest. And uh, you guys are going to be great interventional radiologists in the future. I look forward to seeing you guys and maybe even working with some of you guys. You, know, you can be my, 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 my uh, future partners. And uh, as well, yeah, check out uh, UCLA. We are now, I think we are now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not one of the, uh, um, I think we are um, applying for, for, for residency. I believe you guys may be applying, I'm not sure, but consider coming to UCLA. We've got a great residency program and uh, you can reach out to Arthi Luha or Ed Lee. They're the research guys. They're the resident coordinators. So just make a plug there. And uh, I wish you guys all the best. Thank you so much, Dr. Plotnick. Uh, does anyone have any questions, any final questions, um, any, uh, any, any uh, thing we can um, kind of connect you with? Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Plotnick. Well, you, well you, you guys can email me. Uh, you got my email address. So you can send it out to you guys. And if you, if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to email me. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll get to get a, a Hopefully SIR one day things will open up, we'll get to hang out again. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out any questions at all, please do. Awesome. What was, uh, what was that? Uh, what was that? Can you post your email address again? Yeah, you, 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 you can post my email address to everybody, it's fine. I put it do, in. Do you want me to send yeah, you can put, yeah, I'll, I'll post it in the chat here. Yeah, I'll chat. Here we are. There you go, Royce. Everyone, everyone. There, Vince really sent it out. Fine. All right, good luck, guys. All the best. It's a great career. It's a great, it's a lot of fun and it's a great journey. So enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you guys.